All right, we're going to call to order the March 14th meeting of the Capitola City Council. Do we have any public comment on our closed session items before we recess to closed session? Seeing none, we will recess to closed session and return shortly. Good evening, everyone. Let's go ahead and call to order the Thursday, March 14th, Capitola City Council meeting. Can we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Clark? Here. Councilmember Morgan? Here. Councilmember Peterson? Here. Vice Mayor Brooks? Here. And Mayor Brown? Here. Uh, please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Do we have any additions or deletions to tonight's agenda? Staff has no changes to tonight's agenda. All right, great. We will move on to presentations. We have uh, a couple proclamations tonight. We will start with the mayor's proclamation honoring Capitola Boat and Bait. Um, and so I'm just going to read a little bit from this first. And it says, the Capitola, the city of Capitola recognizes the invaluable contributions made by local businesses to the vibrancy and spirit of our community. Capitola Boat and Bait, nestled on the historic Capitola Wharf, has been a beacon of maritime tradition and adventure as a family business since 1997. Their commitment to providing ex exceptional customer service, expert knowledge, and a welcoming atmosphere has earned them a loyal following amongst residents and visitors, fostering a sense of camaraderie and excitement for all who step foot on the wharf. While the demolition of the building housing Capitola Boat and Bait signifies the end of an era, it also serves as a poignant reminder of the cherished memories made and countless fish tales earned. Capitola Boat and Bait's legacy extends beyond its role as a retail establishment, embodying the spirit, spirit of community and connection that defines Capitola's waterfront culture. I, Kristen Brown, Mayor of the City of Capitola, on behalf of the Capitola City Council, do hereby proclaim our heartfelt gratitude and appreciation to Capitola Boat and Bait for their contributions to our city. We have a bit of a slideshow here. Is there some, would someone like to come and accept the proclamation? I would just like to thank the city council, the mayor, and all our community. Because without you guys, we wouldn't be here. Oh, how about now? Yep. <laughs> I would like to thank the city council and our community because without you guys all being here and having us be part of it, we wouldn't be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Our next uh, proclamation is honoring the Wharf House restaurant. You have another slideshow? That was all the slides? Same slides. Okay. Slide. Just start it over. Perfect. All right. So uh, this proclamation is for the Wharf House restaurant. The city of Capitola uh, acknowledges the Wharf House restaurant nestled upon the picturesque Capitola Wharf as a cherished landmark for decades and owned by Willie Case since 1984 offering delectable seafood dishes, delightful cocktails, top-notch live musical entertainment, and breathtaking views of the Monterey Bay. Their dedication to culinary excellence, impeccable service, and warm hospitality has earned them a special place in the hearts of locals and visitors alike. While the forthcoming demolition of the building housing the Wharf House restaurant marks the end of an era, it also serves as a reminder of the cherished moments shared, celebrations hosted, and friendships forged within its walls. The Wharf House restaurant legacy extends beyond its dining room, embodying the spirit of conviviality, community, and coastal charm that defines Capitola's waterfront. I, Kristen Brown, Mayor of the City of Capitola, on behalf of the Capitola City Council, 
do hereby proclaim our heartfelt gratitude and appreciation to the Wharf House Restaurant for their enduring contributions to our city. Really? Thank you, Mayor slash Supervisor. Uh, Members of the council, members of the administration. Um, is this my obituary? Oh. I, I, I feel like maybe I'm attending my own funeral tonight. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to all the councils that I've had the opportunity to stand in front of uh, in my number of years I've been on, out on that wharf. And um, we've, we've loved our stay and we hope that maybe you'll have us back someday. Yes, sir. Thank you Thank immensely. You. All right, our next presentation is the presentation of the 2023 Capitola Police Officer of the Year and Police Chief's Commendation Award. Great. Hand it over to the Chief. Perfect. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm here this evening to uh, present two different awards. Uh, the, we're going to do the Officer of the Year and then also the Chief's Accommodation Award. Uh, we'll start with the Officer of the Year Award. So we'll have Officer Noah Sharon. Perfect. Um, what I'll do is I'll start with just a highlight of it, and then I'm going to pass it over to uh, Captain Kilroy, and he's going to highlight some of the, the, the things that this uh, officer has done this year. So just to... Uh, Kind of back up a little bit. This, so this is our annual 2023 Officer of the Year Award. It's um, dedicated to Herb Ross, who was a sergeant with the police department. I had the privilege of working with him. I started back here 25 years ago, and I got to work with him for about two or three years, and then he retired. Um, he's just been, we've carried on the tradition of this award, and he really stood behind three kind of big pillars for him, and that was integrity, professionalism, and hard work. And so those are the kind of the founding principles of this award. Um, each year, the command staff comes together, and we evaluate all the different employees, and then we, we bring, this year we had all the command staff come forward and unanimously vote in Noah Sharon as our 2023 Officer of the Year. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Captain Kilroy, who's the command, command of our operations, and he'll give you some highlights. Good evening, Mayor, Council, and staff. Uh, I'd like to just share some, again, highlights uh, about Officer Sheeran, what he accomplished uh, over the calendar year of 2023. This is not a comprehensive list. Again, this is only highlights. Um, and just to give some context, I'd like to give some statistics for the department over that same period of time. Um, so the department as a whole, we answered 14,763 calls for service. Uh, we took 1,585 reports, made 506 arrests, took 166 traffic collision reports and wrote 1,438 traffic citations. Now, Officer Sheeran on his own took 238 reports, made 95 arrests, 17 of those were felony arrests, another 17 were drug related, took 19 traffic collision reports and wrote 289 traffic citations. Outside of doing that, Officer Sharon also has ancillary duties with our department that include being a motor officer. Uh, he's also part of our red light enforcement team. Um, he's part of our social media team, a, a very important part of our social media team. He does a great job uh, and is most recently one of our drone pilots um, that we just launched our new program. He has led e-bike and traffic safety presentations two times at New Brighton Middle School and had a great connection with the school and the students there and staff and parents, actually, and has presented in front of council as well. Uh, Noah is active in any investigation that he can get himself into. Um, sometimes, whether he's wanted or not, he's going to find a way to be a part of it. Uh, and he takes on any task that he's assigned and completes it diligently. Uh, Noah is tenacious and a motivated officer who cares deeply for the capital community and a great asset to our department. With that, I'm going to present our 2023 Officer of the Year Award to Officer Noah Sharon. Council, staff, thank you. Chief and Captain, thank you guys. I just wanted to take a quick moment. Thank you guys for your continued support for our department. 
Um, it's been a pleasure working here. We're all having a great time, and I want to thank my coworkers and family as well. Thank you. Congratulations. And then moving on to the next award, which is um, the first time that I've been able to issue this award, which is an honor and a pleasure of, for me. Um, and quite honestly, just a really outstanding work of the Criminal Investigations Unit. I know you've been getting briefings on that, but really uh, the lead efforts of uh, Detective Zach Courier. And so with that, I'm going to have Captain Kilroy kind of highlight um, the work that he's been doing in that unit as well. So I'm not Zach's direct supervisor. Captain Ryan is, but she's away at, in, at training. So I'm fill in for her. Um, Zach was here when I was hired. Uh, we've had, or I've had, I'd call it my opportunity to work with him as a peer, his direct supervisor, and, and now as a captain overseeing some of his ancillary duties as well. Um, again, talking about just calendar 2023, it was a busy year for our criminal investigations unit. Unfortunately, that means that it's also a busy year for significant crimes for our community. Um, so just to touch on some of the things that uh, Detective Courier was the lead detective on, some of his significant cases. Uh, we had a stabbing on Wharf Road where the suspect was ID'd and arrested. Um, a sexual assault by a child predator. Again, that, that suspect was ID'd and arrested. An attempt sexual assault uh, on a woman that uh, led to, through Detective Courier's diligence, a uh, full confession um, coordinated with an outside agency, Fremont PD, to uh, have that person arrested. That person was arrested a second time for coer coercion and intimidation related to that case. And just one thing to know about Detective Courier, he has a big heart and he has, he's very skilled at uh, connecting with people that he speaks with, whether they be victims, even suspects. Uh, whoever it is, he's just a good communicator. This particular victim told Detective Courier if it were not for his empathy in the way that he treated her, that, that she had ideations of self-harm, um, which she did not fulfill. Another case was a uh, upwards of $150,000 fraud case um, from uh, fraud checks from a business, a local business. Uh, Detective Courier ID'd arrested and got a full confession from that suspect. Uh, we had the armored car robbery at Bay Federal. He's still actively investigating that case. We had another robbery at the Comerica Bank where a tractor, tracker was given to the suspect. Uh, Detective Courier was able to coordinate with his CIU partner, Detective Young, um, the sheriff's office, and San Mateo PD to track that suspect, uh, locate them outside of our jurisdiction and arrest them, and also recovered a handgun related to that arrest. Unfortunately, we uh, lost two of our community members um, to homicides this year. Uh, the first was a vehicular manslaughter that occurred just off of Bay Avenue. Um, when that occurred, there was very limited info on that case. We had just clips of a vehicle that basically showed lighting. We didn't know what type of vehicle it was. Detective Courier, at this point, I really got to see his tenacity and his investigative skills. He was able to establish the route that this vehicle took out of our jurisdiction um, by following up with the residents who had uh, security cameras, obtaining footage, matching it to the vehicle. Using further technology, he was able to finally establish what type of vehicle it was. And using uh, the flock system that we have access to currently in other jurisdictions, was able to identify that vehicle get a plate number, identify the suspect, and later take that person off at the mall and make an arrest. There's more. <laughs> and then we also had uh, another homicide where Detective Courier collaborated with El Cerrito PD. Um, he took lead on that case without an established scene. We didn't know if this crime actually occurred. We didn't know if it was a homicide at first or if it occurred in our jurisdiction or in somebody else's, but Detective Courier took the lead on that. Worked the case from several angles, was able to identify a possible suspect, um, coordinated with a team of Capitola members to recover the body outside of our jurisdiction, located the suspect, and arrested him. And most recently, we had another robbery at the Comerica Bank um, just a couple of weeks ago. And again, using police technology in collaboration with other jurisdictions, was able to identify and arrest that suspect within a couple of weeks. So that's a lot, but that's not all that Zach does. 
So he also has ancillary duties of a defensive tactic instructor, taser instructor. Uh, he's an instructor on a system we call the RAP, uh, stop sticks instructor. He's been selected to our firearms team as an instructor. He's part of our peer support team. He is also part of our social media team, and he's one of our field training officers. Zach is an excellent representative of Capitola PD, and with his big heart and extreme skill at collaborating with other agencies, he's definitely a true asset to not only us, but our community. So thank you, Zach. So with all that, I'm here to present the 2023 Chiefs Accommodation Award um, to Zach, and I just want to say that you have a great police department. We have a great police department, and you have a lot of very hard, hardworking people that come out every day to serve this community. And these are just two highlights, uh, but there's a lot of tremendous work that this department does and continues to do. And, and uh, we thank you guys for your support. And with that, like I said, thank you for coming out. Pretty nice award. Mayor, uh, City Council, I just want to thank you for giving me the opportunity, you know, seven, eight years ago to work for this department. Um, my stepdad was a sergeant here, so um, I grew up around this department. I have a lot of loyalty and, and love for this department. Um, as far as those cases go, you know, it was hard on me and my family. So I wanted to thank uh, my wife, Sabrina, who's here with my baby girl. Uh, she, she'll be uh, 10 months tomorrow uh, for all the hard, uh, long nights, um, the sleepless nights and then my mom for coming out um, and supporting me today um, from Arizona. And Chief and the police department, um, all my peers, thank you for the support and help throughout all my cases um, ever since I've been working here. So I appreciate it and I'm honored to have this award. Thank you. Officer Sharon, uh, Detective Courier, congratulations to both of you. We truly do have a stellar uh, police department here, and we're incredibly grateful for your work and the work of, of all of you here at Capitola PD. Thank you so much. Uh, would any other council members like to make any comments before we move on? I saw some leaning in. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I just, I don't want to take too long, but I really want to echo what our mayor just said. We're really lucky to have such a great police department here. So thank you all. Not that they're listening back there, but um, <laughs> congratulations. And just back to um, the Bow and Bait Proclamation and the Wharf House, I just wanted to um, say thank you for what you've brought to our community. When I moved here over 25 years ago, that was my one of my first stops, being able to fish out there. And I will not tell you if I was having the cocktail in or outside of the building um, that the Wharf House gave us. And um, it was just a, it's a special place. And we, I look forward to seeing what comes next and, and the work we can do in collaboration. So congratulations to our officers and thank you to, to the two um, businesses here this evening. After being in law enforcement for 35 years, I, I really see what these guys do with it. It doesn't go unnoticed. So right, we have a great police department and uh, I'm truly grateful, like all of us. Thank you. All right. Okay, our final, we had a lot to proclaim tonight. So one more proclamation. Uh, Mayor's proclamation in honor of Red Cross Month, which is March 2024. And so this proclamation says, during American Red Cross Month in March, we celebrate the humanitarian spirit of Capitola and reaffirm our commitment to help ensure no one faces a crisis alone. Caring for one another is at the heart of our community and exemplified by the people of Capitola, whose simple acts of kindness through the Red Cross provide help and hope in people's most difficult moments. The contributions of the local Red Cross volunteers, 169 in the county, give hope to the most vulnerable in their darkest hours. Last year in Santa Cruz County, volunteers helped 23 households affected by 16 home fires by addressing their urgent, urgent needs like food and lodging, as well as providing recovery support. In addition, they installed 348 smoke alarms, collected over 4,013 blood donations, provided first aid and CPR training to over 3,209 residents, helped the families of 390 students prepare for disasters through our pillowcase project, and assisted 75 families of our armed forces. 
Their support, volunteerism, and generous donations are critical to our community's resilience. I, Kristen Brown, Mayor of the City of Capitola, hereby proclaim March 2024 as Red Cross Month. I encourage all citizens of Capitola to reach out and support its humanitarian mission. Yes. Do we have, yes, great. I want to um, thank the, the chamber and all the citizens of Capitola for honoring the Red Cross this month. And to remind you all, we always looking for more volunteers, blood drives. We do one at the Mid-County Senior Center, Center um, every other month. So there's lots of ways you can come out and, and help support the Red Cross. Thank you very much. Thank you. I also want to say thank you. Um, with our previous storms that happened, we had some unfortunate events and trees went down in a nearby community and within minutes the Red Cross was there to help the families that were displaced four families and their kids and their pets and um, within minutes so I just want to say thank you so much for the work you've done in the community the past gosh years with all of these storms thank you all right uh, with that we will move on we're on item four which is a report on closed session Good evening. Closed session was had on the item on the agenda and no reportable action was taken. Great, thank you. Uh, item five, any additional materials? Staff distributed the presentations for tonight's presentation items to City Council before the meeting. They're available in the agenda packet online and in the back for public review. Great, thank you. We'll go now to oral communications by members of the public. This is an opportunity for members of the public to address the council on items not on tonight's agenda. You will have three minutes to speak. Let me turn the timer here. Three minutes to speak. Uh, please state your name for the record if you would like it included in the minutes. Thank you very much. Hello, welcome. Gary Richard Arnold. Uh, good to see you another evening here. It was like <laughs> we're meeting uh, quite often. Uh, two things. Um, I want to honor local police because in other sanctuary cities, and while we have a sanctuary state, I encourage you to make a resolution to not make the city of uh, Capitola a sanctuary city. This is where the drugs come in to kill our children and to uh, cause all kinds of crime, move in gangs, etc. Also, <clears throat> The uh, so-called uh, cutting of the ribbon for the Red Cross, that is being taken at every city council. You have not decided this. This comes from AMBAG, which is a COG, a council of government, which the uh, mayor attended last night, and she does not, or she has not in the past, written a report. It's a stealth organization. It's a cog, a council of government, of governments, which is no more than a Soviet that's run by the UN and the World Bank. <clears throat> and you have no idea what they're approving for you folks out here. When they approve something, they're told they're gonna get federal and state money. So they're tripling your damn tax and they never let you know what these things are going on. It's not on community TV. You need to understand the stealth and evilness of what's going on with COGS. Pull out of the California City of uh, California League of Cities and pull out of AMBAG. It is, uh, <laughs> it's evil and it's designed to destroy you and create a world government under regions which are no more than Soviets. Also, your presentation or your uh, praise for the Red Cross. The Red Cross, if you do not know, was involved in supporting Lenin. They had a Red Cross mission going, you know, after the Kerensky Revolution, there was a, uh, a group going there. There were only four or five medical people. The rest were bankers. They supported Lenin. And right now, the Red Cross, if you can get that lady up here or have your police investigators look at it, they're supplying packets for those coming over the border by the millions where they can get free everything while you got people out on the streets here, veterans not getting a damn thing. And uh, what you have here is on COPA. Uh, the last time I got in here, 
I, I, there was, you were in a legal meeting and I spread information uh, for each one of you. I ended up with the city manager having a policeman comments, handcuff me and take me out of here because I comments, couldn't sir. communicate to you. You need to be sir, representative your three minutes is up. and Thank not you for part your of comments. a Soviet. Hi, welcome. Hi, my name is Goran Klapic. One time I was a security guard here for Zeldas on the beach uh, for, uh, uh, for a summer, I think, if I remember correctly. I was doing the front door with uh, my black brother, George. We did the front door. I want to draw you the attention to something that I've been talking to uh, Captain Sarah Ryan about this in, uh, in the previous past. Uh, the, uh, there was a amount of cocaine being uh, sold uh, through a business here in Capitola by a big, uh, big, by big amounts, and uh, I hope that this will be recorded very soon by the PD, and that also the sheriff's uh, deputies will take care of this. What I've been talking about, I know when I'm being threatened about what I'm talking here about, but I don't care about that. I'm a Schweizer Army veteran. That's a Swiss Army veteran. I can hold my ground. Thank you for, very much for listening. Have a great day. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Dear, was it like this? Okay, I'm not very good in this, but I'm going to try. Dear Mayor and City Council members, my name is Charlotte Link, and I'm a resident of the Cabrillo Mobile Home Estate. I'm here to represent two other residents of this mobile home park, Ms. Judith Babas and Ms. Am Lam, who are here with me. We are here to inform you, to inform the City Council that Fiera Enterprises, the owner of the Cabrillo Mobile Home Estate, has not yet adjusted their rent amounts according to the City of Capitola Rent Stabilization Ordinance. Both ladies are still paying $1,000 per month space rent. I notified Katie Hurley, the Community Development Director of this issue, by email in December of 23. We did receive a note from Katie that Fiera Enterprises will be adjusting the rents and providing credits for overcharges. The two residents haven't seen the charge on their rent bill yet, have not seen the change on the rent bill yet, even though Fiera Enterprises promised it to fix it. I was in touch with Katie about this again. <coughs> Excuse me. Katie Hurley recommended that these residents should seek guidance from an attorney. We talked to our attorney, Bruce Stanton, and he said that the city of Capitola should be the one to enforce their rent stabilization ordinance. How can the city and council assist these residents? There's more information on the rent ordinance in chapter 2.18.200, remedies and waivers and rights, number 8 A and B. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Congratulations on your high vote, <laughs> Marilyn Garrett. And when my daughter was little, she got the DPT vaccination. She's 55 now, <laughs> but she got extremely ill, what you call adverse reactions. And fortunately, somebody recommended a homeopathic doctor. And I brought her up on homeopathic remedies after that. No more vaccines, no more antibiotics. So I've been reading up over these years, including on the COVID shots. And you'll see my fact shirt about the death count is inaccurate. Vaccines are poison. The media, the pharmaceutical industries are lying to us. Lying is nothing new on their part. So I want to share with you, because being informed helps protect our health. The source of this information is westonaprice.org. They put out a brochure, Myths and Truths About COVID-19, Contagious Virus or 5G Microwave Technology. And it turns out 
that epidemiological observations and biological studies indicate the symptoms of COVID-19 are actually radiation poisoning symptoms starting in Wuhan when they rolled out hundreds or thousands of these 5G radiation-emitting sites and followed to other countries. They also put out a fly. I'm going to leave you with this because it's important to be informed, well-documented document, COVID shots for adults and children, what we know now. And it turns out there are more adverse effects and deaths from the COVID shots than from all the other vaccines combined. And the official reporting system, vaccine adverse reporting system, as of May 2023, displayed nearly 2.5 million adverse events following COVID vaccination, included, including over 35,000 reported deaths. As I listen to the awards of your policemen here and about two homicides, He's doing his job, but there's no liability for the pharmaceutical industry causing deaths. So I'm going to leave you with this, and Thank I you. hope you look at it carefully and avoid shots and avoid recommending them. Thank you They're for dangerous. your comments. Thank we you. appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, welcome. There is a timer. Hi, my name is still James Ewing Whitman. You know, it's pretty amazing. Gary Richard Arnold and Marilyn Garrett are, have been publicly commenting more than anybody else I know. Except for myself in the past five years, that would be me. So, you know, I did a calculation. I met the person who's been the CEO of the American Red Cross. I've given at least 12 gallons of blood in my life. Um, I have my reasons why I'd be very hesitant to currently take any blood from the American Red Cross. So I also did a calculation, I'm just kind of a nerd sometimes, and um, I figured in the three counties, San Benito, Monterey, and Santa Cruz, by information I got today, it's almost 712,000 individuals. Let's say half of those are adults. There were three individuals that were at the AMBAG meeting last night, and I was one of them, and I had a great deal of fun after the executive meeting where I just kind of described to them who I was and what I had been doing. I decided to introduce myself to the group as Heisenberg. You guys can laugh or not. Um, so it's really quite fascinating. This is like 124 pages. I spent a couple minutes on this. Um, this was the kind of the AMBAG schedule. It was interesting, the new characters that are in that group. It really reminds me about stuff I spoke of three years ago, where the Rand Corporation established 1948 would give Congress notes for their summer reading, so they didn't really necessarily have to spend as much time reading thousands of pages. I know in the county of Santa Cruz, by my count, and I'm probably way off in the low, and, and saying this is low, but at least 120,000 pages have been basically rubber stamped over the past four years. I mean, I don't have great attendance, but I have better attendance during public comments physically than any of the last eight supervisors. So I guess I'm just interested, and uh, it was sure nice to hear the awards in this room. It was sure nice to hear the awards in the county of Santa Cruz. Um, I had been asking several times publicly, particularly when they tried to reprimand me for not being polite. I said, if the sheriff, I said, I am being polite. If the sheriff was here, I would be more direct. So I started my public comments saying it looks like Team Democide won again. So why do I say that? There's a huge difference between a constitutional republic sheriff and what I see too much, and I don't want to step on anybody's toes, would be a constitutional, corporate, democratic, democide sheriff. Um, so as I said, 2024 is going to be a real time for us to work together, and I would really like to see that. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Any further public comments? Seeing none. All right, we will close uh, oral communications and bring it to staff and city council comments. Do we have any staff comments? 
None. Okay, we will start with council comments. Uh, we'll start at this end. Great. So as most of you probably know, the United States Coast Guard is planning to remove the Santa Cruz mile buoy. The iconic mile buoy is the only navigation aid in the North Monterey Bay. Uh, it's very important to our boating community and our mariners. What I would like to do is see our city council and the mayor put it on the agenda and so we can oppose the moving of the mile buoy. I think it's very important. So we'll look, we'll look forward to that if everybody's in favor. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I would like to ask staff to please look into the mobile home estates. Um, I know that we asked in December for staff to, or for staff to support or at least look into it to make sure that they were follow, following the new um, requirements please do that. And also I want to say congratulations to our mayor for taking the lead in um, county uh, district two county supervisor. More to come in November for the community to still have to vote, but I'm proud to be sitting next to you and um, I just want to say congratulations. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, I've got several comments. Um, I will start uh, with saying I'm in agreement uh, with Council Member Clark if we could get a letter in opposition of the moving or removing of the mile buoy. Um, there's also been um, some discussion about an ex expanded marine protection area, which generally sounds great, um, but there would cause potentially some restrictions on recreational fishing in our area, which is problematic. And so I would like to see uh, a letter of opposition uh, to that expanded area as well, brought back to the council on our consent uh, uh, agenda uh, in the next meeting. Uh, I want to take a moment also to once again um, acknowledge the good work of the Red Cross. My husband is a Red Cross volunteer in the um, Sound the Alarm program, installing fire alarms in homes that otherwise would not have them or have uh, old ones that no longer work. Fire safety is incredibly important, so I encourage those who are interested in learning more about Red Cross uh, opportunities to reach out and consider becoming a volunteer. Um, I would also like to ask staff uh, to bring back a resolution making May 11th all Santa Cruz County cleanup day. This is something that is initiated by Pitch in Santa Cruz County. Um, and so I think that that's something that's really important for us to consider, uh, you know, the efforts to clean up our county and have coastal cleanups. And so if we could bring that back. And then finally, just um, a notice. Uh, some of you may have heard this on the news or seen it in the Sentinel, and I'm just going to repeat it again because I think it's, it, it bears repeating. Um, starting just a couple days ago on March 11th, uh, crews closed the Capitola Avenue overcrossing. This is part of the uh, RTC and Caltrans Santa Cruz County multimodal uh, corridor project, and the closure is going to be up to 14 months. And the closure is so that we can develop a uh, bus on shoulder and auxiliary lanes on Highway 1. And then uh, there will be a demolition of the Capitola Avenue overcrossing. And it will be replaced with a new overcrossing that has safer bike and pedestrian facilities, which is really important because this is one of the safe routes to school. Um, on Saturday, March 23rd, starting at 7 p.m., uh, until Sunday, March 24th at 7 p.m., there will be a full closure of Highway 1 between uh, Bay and Park. So please be aware of that. There will be a detour for that full 24-hour period. You might hear some noise during the demolition, um, but it's just we're making way for, for bigger and better things in terms of safer uh, pedestrian and bicyclist paths. So once again, Capitola Avenue overcrossing is now closed for the next 14 months. Between Saturday, March 23rd and 24th, there will be a 24-hour closure of Highway 1 uh, in that area, so please do be aware. Okay, thank you, ma'am. All right, uh, we're going to move on if there's uh, additional council comment. No? No staff? Uh, point of order, don't you have a Sir responsibility to read public from AMBAG? Sir, public show. comment has closed. Soviet to the public. Sir, this is your warning that you're interrupting a public meeting. And the Brown Act. This is your last warning for interrupting a public meeting, sir. Make a decision. Don't you lecture sir, me. Sir, this is your Don't last you warning that you are interrupting a public meeting. All right, we're going to move on. Uh, we're on our consent agenda, item eight. 
Uh, all items on consent will be enacted in one motion on the form listed below. There will be no separate discussion on these items prior to the time the council votes on the action, unless members of the council request specific items to be discussed for separate review. I can move the consent. I'll second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. We'll move on to item nine, general government and public hearings, and item 9A is voter polling results. And I will turn it over to staff. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So we're going to get a presentation from EMC. Jessica Polsky-Sanchez will be leading the presentation. This is the first time we've used EMC for our polling and look forward to seeing the results. So Jessica, take it away. Thank you so much. I will go ahead and share the screen. Okay, thank you. It's nice to be here before you this evening. I'm here to present the results of the recent survey of voters here in City of Capitola. It's pretty hard to hear if you can tune that up. Okay, thank you. Can we, I'm going to ask that we have no more outbursts from the audience, please. The time for public comment has closed. People there will be, like to hear what's sir, I understand, sir, and it is our responsibility to ensure that the people will hear what is happening, but I am asking that there are no further outbursts from the audience. There will be an opportunity for public comment on each individual item, comments based on that item alone, but I am asking at this time that there are no further comments from the audience at a time that is not designated for public comment. Thank you. Um, City Clerk, is there an opportunity to turn this up? Um, Jessica, I think what might help is turning your camera off so we can use the bandwidth for sound rather than using it up for video. Absolutely. One sec. All right, we're working on turning up the volume on our, on our end. Okay, how does that sound? About the same. We're working on it to see if there's anything we can do. Thank you. I'm hearing an echo. I'm not sure if that's uh -oh. what's causing the sound issue. We might just have to ask, whoa, now that was me. Yeah. Now I'm very loud. Uh, we might just have to ask you to use your outside voice on this one. Sure thing. Uh, if I get too quiet, feel free to interrupt. It's okay. the echo that's keeping me from being too loud. <laughs> okay. Okay, so this is a survey of voters sorry, just, here in the city of Capitola. I'm sorry to that interrupt. Just give us one more one more minute here. I think we actually made it worse. So <laughs> give us one uh, second. We're okay. going to try to get it louder. We're doing some troubleshooting here. Thank you for your patience. Jessica, could we ask you to test your sound really quickly? If you wouldn't mind just speaking while we adjust the volume so we can see if it's working. Sure, testing, how does that sound? Um, we're still troubleshooting, would you mind doing that again? Yeah, well, the echo is gone on my end. Um, oh, much better. Ah, wonderful. Thank you. Shall I proceed? Yes, please do. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so these are the results of the survey of voters here in City of Capitola that was conducted in January of this year. We conducted 206 interviews with the voters here in the city. The overall margin of error is therefore plus or minus 6.8 percentage points. We did offer interviews in both English and Spanish. Uh, live telephone calls uh, were conducted by trained professional interviewers and online interviews were collected by both text and email invitations to voters. And we do have some data uh, that was provided from prior research here in the city conducted uh, by other firms as listed on this chart. And we'll show you some comparisons uh, to results over time on questions that have been tracked. First, some key findings, and then I'll share some more detailed results. We do see that Capitola voters overall are optimistic about the direction of the community and most 
say the city is doing a good job on its essential functions. We see a majority of voters recognizing the need for additional funding, and we also see a majority willing to maintain services through additional taxes. Maintaining, maintaining public safety response, uh, repairing potholes, roads, sidewalks, bike lanes, and the beach and New Wharf are top priorities for voters when it comes for additional it comes to additional funding. And we see support for a renewal of the expiring quarter cent sales tax is well above the 50% threshold needed to pass. When it comes to a potential bond measure, we see voter opinions are more divided. So starting back at the beginning, a few uh, questions that we asked in the survey to understand the overall issue environment here in the city. Do you feel things in Capitola are generally going in the right direction? Or do you feel that things have gotten pretty seriously off on the wrong track? And as you see, this question does not relate to the job the city is doing specifically. It's simply a question to understand how voters are feeling about how things are going very broadly. You can see here the vast majority of voters in the city are feeling good. They're feeling optimistic. 75% say things are headed in the right direction. Only 19% say things are off on the wrong track and 6% can't say one way or another. We asked this open-ended question, what do you think is the most important problem facing Capitola today to see which issues would rise to the top as uh, top mentions among those issues facing the city? Coming up more, more often than any other issue is housing affordability, 18% mention this, followed by infrastructure or beautification issues mentioned by 14%, Storm damage, flooding, and wharf repair mentioned by 12%, followed by traffic and congestion, climate change issues, cost of living, supporting the local economy, and a variety of other issues, as you can see on this list. Here you can see trend data over time when we've asked voters how they would rate this, the job the city is doing on providing services and taking care of the needs of local residents. On the top, the most recent poll shows us that 12% rate that as excellent, 55% good, 24% only fair, and 6% poor. And those ratings compare very similarly to the ratings uh, that we saw or that you saw back in 2022. So uh, two thirds positive this time, 71% positive in 2022. When it comes to how voters rate the job the city is doing managing the city's budget and finances, we also see a majority giving a positive rating, 60% excellent or good, and 31% only fair or poor. Uh, so the, that is a positive rating overall for management of the budget and finances. And the numbers are similar uh, to the numbers seen in 2022. With the closing of the gap there, are fewer people saying they don't know. Um, we see the uh, filling in of the good category as well as only fair. We ask this question, generally speaking, would you say that the city of Capitola has a great need for more money, some need, a little need, or no real need for more money? And this is a question that has been asked over time here in the city. You can see now that 19% see a great need and 44% some need for more money for the city. On the other hand, 31% see little or no need. So more than half, but fewer than two thirds, seeing an, at least some need for additional funding. A couple questions that we asked in the survey to understand tax sentiment. We said, do you agree or disagree with the statement, I generally oppose increases to taxes regardless of what they are used for? We have 16% who strongly agree and 27% who somewhat agree with that statement, but the majority disagree and express willingness to support taxes. On the second statement, do you agree or disagree? It is crucial to have high quality city services, even if it means raising taxes. About three out of four voters at least somewhat agree with that statement. Okay, on the next slide, we'll share um, what happened when we presented a potential ballot question 
uh, to renew the city's quarter cent percent sales tax. We said without increasing taxes to protect essential city services, including public safety and emergency services, maintain parks, beaches, the new wharf, and recreation programs for youth and seniors, improve traffic safety, repair potholes, and maintain streets, sidewalks, and bike lanes, shall the city adopt a measure renewing its expiring one quarter percent sales tax, providing a million dollars annually for general government use until ended by voters with independent audits, public disclosure of all spending, and all funds staying local. If the election were held today, would you vote yes or no on this measure? And you can see very strong, widespread support for this renewal measure, uh, with 75% initially saying they would vote yes, and another 3% undecided, but when prompted, which way do you lean? They lean toward voting yes. So that brings us to a total of 78% inclined to vote yes for this measure, 21% inclined to vote no, and 1% undecided. We also asked a series of questions uh, around the potential components or uh, outcomes to be funded um, by this potential measure and individually asked on a scale from one to seven, how important is each of these to you? Where one is not at all important and seven is extremely important. So on this slide, we're sharing the proportion for each item that rated, rated it as a, a seven, extremely important, along with the five or six, at least somewhat important. Uh, rising to the top of the, the list is maintaining public safety and emergency services. Almost universally, voters consider that important, with 58% saying that's extremely important. Followed by repairing potholes and maintaining streets, sidewalks, and bike lanes. Again, almost universally important to voters, with 50% who rate that as extremely important. Other items also very, very important shown on this list as you move down. Um, these are ordered based on the portion rating it as a seven, but there are items on the list that are uh, overwhelmingly important, like maintaining the beach and new wharf, supporting local businesses, um, and so on and so forth. We also asked these uh, items in the series. You can see here uh, that the items on this slide are important to the majority, um, but with lower intensity than the items seen on the prior slide. The last three, um, kind of related to a potential bond measure, um, are a little bit lower priority than the other items. We also offered some additional information in the survey on the features and benefits of a potential uh, sales tax renewal measure. And we asked how convincing is each of these as a reason to support the measure? Is it very convincing, somewhat convincing, not too convincing, or not at all convincing? And you can see on this slide, the portion that rated each of these as very or somewhat convincing with the totals on the right-hand side. So rising to the top, is the mention that by law, essential purchases like groceries and medicine are exempt from the sales tax to help ensure the measure is not a burden to those on fixed income. Certainly a very important piece of information um, and 88% consider that a convincing reason to support the measure. The second one highlights that the measure does not increase taxes. It simply continues an existing voter approved funding source that is convincing to 81%. And then uh, the last on this slide, highlighting that the measure will help make much needed upgrades to aging public infrastructure, like filling hot holes, potholes, repaving streets, uh, and making improvements to bike paths, sidewalks, and traffic safety. 84% say that that is a convincing reason to support the measure. The remaining items uh, summarized on this slide, all of these are convincing to the vast majority as reasons to support the measure, including maintaining the city as a great place to live, work, and raise a family, um, highlighting that out-of-town visitors pay their fair share, the measure requires uh, fiscal accountability features, and that the measure help, helps keep Capitola safe. Once this information was provided in the survey, we once again followed up about the potential measure, asking voters, given everything you've heard now, how would you vote if this measure were on the ballot today? And you can see that uh, the additional information increases support for the potential measure. 
On the flip side, we also offered some uh, information that you might hear or some statements that you might hear from somebody who would oppose the measure. We summarized things like uh, now is not the time, uh, the cost of living is high, this measure is going to be hard for people to pay for, families are struggling and things like that. And so we asked after an opposition statement, given everything you've heard, how would you vote? And you can see there is um, quite an impact after opposition with 60% uh, supporting the measure after the statement, um, but still well above the 50 plus one threshold for passage. Wanted to share a look back um, at historical poll results as well as revenue measure uh, results in elections here in city of Capitola. Uh, initial support for a renewal um, of the quarter cent sales tax today is similar to the level seen in polling ahead of Measure F, which was a 10-year extension of the expiring quarter cent sales tax. Um, we do, however, see that the current measure is a bit more vulnerable to opposition. In this survey, we also investigated a potential bond measure. So after uh, we thoroughly investigated opinions around a potential renewal of the quarter cent sales tax, we then said, here is another measure that could appear on a future ballot to update public safety facilities and ensure prompt response in emergencies, provide improved parks, beach and recreational facilities, fix leaky roofs, ensure the police station and city hall are earthquake and flood safe, and modernize the Capitola Community Center shall the city issue $30 million in general obligation bonds at the rate of $49 per 100,000 of assessed property value, averaging 1.5 million annually until repaid with independent oversight and annual audits and all funds benefiting the city of Capitola. When we asked about this measure, uh, we saw roughly half of voters inclined to vote yes and the other half inclined to vote no, although the yes um, outweighs the no by just a couple percentage points. Also, we asked a few questions about uh, information sources and preferred methods of communication. Uh, so here are some sources where people might get information about Capitola city government. And we asked about each one, how useful is this as a source of information about city government? Very useful, somewhat useful, or not useful. And so you can see rising to the top, local news media, which 24% find very useful and 44% somewhat useful, followed by the city printed newspapers, which more than half, 58%, consider at least somewhat useful, followed by the city's website or posts on Instagram or Facebook, Facebook. 56% saying that's at least somewhat useful. And then lastly, just under half saying that the city's digital newsletters are at least somewhat useful. And on this question, if you were interested in a city issue and wanted to learn more in which of these would you most likely participate? And we offered these responses, attending an in-person meeting, watch on YouTube or the city website, attend a Zoom meeting, send an email, email or letter to the city, watch on community tele television or none of these. And you can see um, the most uh, commonly selected are attending an in-person meeting or watching on YouTube or the city's website, about one in four mentioning each of those. Uh, similar to what we saw, uh, what you saw back in 2022, although we've seen an increase in the portion saying um, that they would watch on YouTube or the city website. So in summary, we are seeing support for renewing the existing quarter cent sales tax is in a strong place. Uh, we see that uh, a potential renewal measure is somewhat vulnerable to opposition, but given that tax sensitivity is relatively low and that support remains above the passage threshold even after opposition, uh, we, see, we think that a measure um, to renew the current quarter cent sales tax is certainly feasible. Um, a bond would face a more difficult path with a two-thirds threshold for passage, um, but we do want to point out that we tested a potential bond measure after exploring a sales tax measure, including opposition arguments against a measure. 
Um, we do think it's important to involve the community in a conversation about any potential measure. We need uh, to make sure that the need has been clearly communicated uh, for revenue to maintain quality services, emphasizing the benefits to the community. And when it comes to those benefits, the ones that align well with voters' top priorities include maintaining public safety response, roads, and the beach and the new wharf. Um, other priorities also rise to the top as being important to the vast majority, like youth and recreation uh, and support for small businesses. So with that, I am more than happy to answer any questions you have about the survey results. Thank you. Uh, council questions. Questions on this end? No? Questions on this end? No? All right. Thank you so much for that presentation. We really appreciate it. Thank we you. are going to bring this item now. Can we turn us down just a little bit? No, thank you. Uh, we are going to bring this item now to public comment. If there's any member of the public that would like to address us on this item specifically, please approach the podium. Welcome back. Yes, my name is James Ewing. Correct me, can I make comments on this? I mean, this was about a poll that was given. It doesn't seem like it was actually much about the election. So if I can I talk about kind of elections or should I just talk about the poll? Because otherwise I'm not going to say anything. Yeah, so this public comment is specifically for... The poll. Uh, yes, the poll, these polling results. Fair enough. Thank you. Okay. Uh, seeing no further public comment, we'll bring it back to council. This was just um, informational, correct? We're just receiving the survey. There's no vote on this? There's no vote needed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, staff is looking for direction, whether you want to give us direction about any potential further actions to take in this regard or anything else. All right. Additional comments? Comments from council members? Comments on this end? Well, is, no? so is now the time that we're discussing whether or not we want to Ballot. It would be an appropriate time for us to that discuss happen. that? Yeah. Certainly, it's an appropriate time to discuss it. The deadline to place an item on the ballot is August 9th, I believe. Um, so we would need to do it before July. Uh, so we do have time. But if you would like staff to research anything further, to engage with stakeholders, any kind of direction, if you want us to bring back more information about other forms of tax, now would be the time to let us know. Okay, um, this was fascinating information. It's really great news. Um, I think with the with us knowing about the ending of Measure F coming up and our deficit spending in the budget in the, within the next five years, I'd like for staff to come back with um, some different options for us to choose what we're going to put on the ballot based off of this information. So we have the quarter. Um, cent option. I'd like to look into what a half cent option is, as well as perhaps looking at, um, bec and I can get the years wrong, so let me think about this. I know Measure F ends in two years, 2027, and there just might be um, an opportunity to to put something on the ballot that could then in turn make that happen earlier, if you're catching what I'm I'm saying if that makes sense to council. So if count, uh, staff could come back with just an option of perhaps asking the community to vote on something that would essentially um, supersede or measure F um, in the meantime. So half cent and a quarter cent option to council before August. That's what I'd like to see staff bring forward. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, briefly, they spoke about the bond, so I would like to hear more about that um, as we move forward. Even though it didn't seem like it was his favorite as much, I think it's something for us to definitely look into. Okay. I would agree. Three options is always better than two, so we can have a more lively discussion. All right. So we have given some direction to staff. Any further comments from council? Last call? All right, uh, with that, we will move on from this item. We will go to item 9B, our housing element update and 2023 annual report.
Do we have good news? Do we have good news? Do we have neutral news? Anything other than bad news? I've got great news. we're going to find out. We have some good news here. Um, <laughs> okay, I wanted to give... It is really loud. Okay. Okay. Tonight I'm going to give you an update on the Capitola, on three things, our housing element, our implementation plan, and our sixth cycle, or a fifth cycle update. So first I'll give you an update on the housing element. How's the volume? Hold on, I think we're just going to wait for the volume a little bit. Can you test your uh, mic one more time? <laughs> Can you tell us again what we're getting an update on? Getting an update on the housing element. I think it's still pretty loud. Is that better? Good? All right. Okay, thank you. We're good. Thank you. <laughs> That's technical difficulties tonight. Okay. So our sixth cycle housing element, we've been working on it for about a year and a half to two years at this point. Next slide, please. So the most recent update, I brought you an update, I think, two meetings ago um, on the mall site, and we were discussing the need that came from the, the property owners of the mall during that sent in a letter about our housing element, need for extra height, and also to remove the floor area ratio from the uh, parking garage calculate from the parking garages from the floor area ratio calculation. We during during that meeting. Um, further guidance was given to also include objective standards to make sure the design works well. And then we had a representative from Merlone Geyer who, who spoke in front of the city council and they asked um, that we look further into the number of units that were assigned directly to Merlone Geyer. So after, um, I've had several meetings with Merlone Geyer in the um, past three weeks and we will be meeting again as soon as we have our, our next update. Um, but we've been working closely together. And at this point, we, what I decided would probably be the best pass, path forward for Capitola is to distribute the housing requirements to all the sites on the mall so that there, I think there's 10 properties on the mall. So just dispersing them rather than just putting them on the Merlone Geyer sites. And so all of the properties on the mall would have these, actually the way we had originally drafted it would be subject to these um, allowances of additional height and floor area ratio. But this will disperse the housing over the whole site. There'll be a 15% affordable housing requirement for very low and low, and then a 5% requirement for moderate income. So they get a little bit extra and it's all spread out. So we're adding sites to our inventory. And here on this map you're seeing arrows are pointing to the new sites, um, so including the banks on the corner, the target site, um, some more parking lot area, and also the Ross Center site. Next slide, please. This sheet breaks down exactly where the other sites are, and I'm sorry that um, it's listed by number according to the previous slides map, but as you saw, all sites, except for the coals, that will not be included, and also a parking lot as you um, go out the food court, that will not be included due to long-term lease agreements and long-term parking agreements. But otherwise, every site on within the Clare Street, 41st Avenue, and Capitola Road will be included. Um, and so what this does is it, it results um, in... For lower income, it creates uh, 368 units, moderate income. So what we'll, in summary, we'll meet our RENA numbers and we'll still have buffers within our RENA numbers by dispersing these sites, but without overburdening one developer within the mall. So next slide, please. Um, and this slide is just showing the two parcels that are not in being included, but I did want the city council to see that if they were if they were to move coals to a different site and decide to develop it, there's quite a number of units that could be built on those sites. So we're not saying they can't develop those sites. We're just not including them in the inventory because it's probably not going to happen in the next eight-year cycle. Next 
Next slide, please. So that is my update of where we're headed with the housing element. So um, I'll, and now I'll do the housing element implementation plan. So within our housing element for, that uh, we're moving forward with, there are goals, policies, and programs. We have over 80 items outlined within our housing element um, that we're required to perform on in the first three years of the eight-year cycle. Next slide, please. I've broken these into categories um, and for each item, and then just looking at the timing and who will be implementing. Go to the next slide, please. So this first, uh, we're, as we move forward, we're going to be working with having partnerships with our local nonprofits. So for developer interest and outreach and public information, we're already working with housing groups within Santa Cruz and also the YIMBY group to help us get information out. We're hoping to do some public outreach during Affordable Housing Month in May. And um, just this past Monday, I coordinated with other community development directors and we'll all be doing a panel um, in May. And then I've also reached out to Housing Santa Cruz, Elaine Johnson, and offered if we could host something here in our council chambers in May. So that, those are the items that we're moving forward with. Next slide. In gray or darker gray are the items that city staff will be working on. I'm not going to read these over for you, but these are the internal items that we'll be working on and we don't um, we won't be hiring a third party or leaning on our legal team to um, do. Next slide, please. So next I'm going to break these down into the, the items that we will be hiring third parties. And I also just want to present what the cost is associated with our housing element update and um, where the money will come from. So we have a housing successor agency fund. This is from um, the previous development or redevelopment agency funding. And we have a healthy amount of money in that uh, because of a, a loan that was paid off within the last few years. Um, so out of the housing successor agency fund, I'm proposing that our emergency rental assistance continue to come out of that fund, as well as our security deposit program. The emergency rental assistance is run by CAB. Um, and provides up to four months of rent for very low income to avoid homelessness. And it's been a very successful program, and we currently give $25,000 a year towards that. So over the eight years, it'll be $200,000. And then our security deposit program, in which we allow up to, uh, I think it's one month's rent, um, which is given to a low income, is low income, we qualify for it. And um, at the end of your rent, you get we get the money back. So seventy. $500 over eight years is 60000 Next slide, please. Um, grants, we currently have, I'll start with the second grant, the municipal code updates. We received the REAP 2.0 grant and are working on code updates with that money. And then also rehabilitation project, rehab projects for, um, we're going to be, I think it was the last city council meeting in which the city council gave us direction to move forward with Paul Ashby of, um, to start applying for a home application for a rehab project of the Dakota Apartments, which is on the corner of Claire's and um, Capitola Road. So we have a little over 800000 or almost actually close to 900000 in um, money that has come back into our home fund, reuse money. And then we are talking with them now about applying for up to about $3 million in rehab somewhere. I think $3 million would be the, the higher limit there, so up to. Um, so you'll, in, you'll be seeing a resolution soon for our application for those funds, and that will fund 24 units of the Dakota apartments. And next slide, please. And then our housing trust fund. This is the money that the city receives when um, a developer pays an in-lieu fee or um, our impact fee when, they, when you develop within Capitola. And that housing trust fund can be used for home buyer assistance programs as well as rehabilit rehab programs. So I'll be working with Sam's team on these projects of creating programs for home buyer assistance and rehab. We've had programs in the past and we'll be bringing them back. Um, the initial cost associated with developing these programs is about 25,000 each. 
And then once we have the program in place, the ongoing costs um, are at about 325,000 combined over the eight year period. So that summarizes um, where we are moving, how we're moving forward with implementation. And the good news is none of this is coming out of the general fund. Um, so the housing successor agency, there's close to $2 million in that account. And I think we've discussed in the past um, that money can also be used for affordable housing projects for development. So it's a nice healthy balance. And then uh, the grant money will be really exciting if we can get that for the Dakota apartments. So next slide, please. So next is our annual housing report. I just want to bring you up to date with our numbers for 2023 and the closeout for the fifth cycle. Um, in 2023, we're required to give an annual housing report that's due to HCD every April. Um, in 2023, we added 15 new units to the city of Capitola. One was a single family home and the rest were all ADUs. So we're having great success with our ADU programs. Um, in the fifth cycle, this just, uh, this takes you from 2015 to 2023. We were assigned 143 RENA numbers. Mm -hmm. And in the end, we slightly, um, we met just over half. We built 75 new units and didn't meet our RENA number, but um, 73 were remaining. Next slide, please. Exciting, this is the good news. We've got two projects, one that's been approved at 4401 Capitola Road, 36 units, and Planning Commission will be reviewing an application for another affordable housing, 100% affordable housing project at 1098 38th Avenue, hopefully during their April meeting. Uh, they're doing the last of their CEQA documents right now. So it's another 52 units. So between those two projects, we'll have exceeded our count with, that we reached within our the last housing cycle. So that's the great news. And I'll, I think that's my last slide for this evening. So our recommendation tonight was to receive the presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. So um, my first question is that you've been meeting with Merlo and Geyer a lot recently. And I'm wondering if there's been any discussions about a potential timeline for redevelopment? Well, um, they're, they're now not saying that they are not going to redevelop within the eight year period. So that's exciting. So uh, within Simply this cycle, years. <laughs> yeah, our next housing cycle is the next eight years. And I think they're, they're really happy with the direction we're moving. And it seems a lot more positive, but they haven't, they have not, to my knowledge, started designing a project, or I don't expect one within the next year. But they've been great discussions, and it's definitely headed in the right direction. Thank you. And then um, regarding the uh, six additional sites on the Capitola Mall, I'm wondering if there has been any communication with the owners of those properties, and if they have suggested one way or another if it's likely or unlikely to be redeveloped. You know, I haven't heard from any of the other mall owners at this time. Um, I know the Citibank is vacant at this time, and there's a recent new buyer. Um, yeah. And then uh, my third question is about the security deposit program. I see that it's expected to cost $60,000 over the next eight years. Is that right? Is that off? We go back to that slide, maybe. Um, that's, that was going to be my question. Is that like assuming nobody, none of the money comes back? Or is that including the money that's being recycled into the program? So that's, in, so sorry, that's over the eight year period, but it's not factoring in the money being recycled. So it's just, you know, there'll be a, a balance of 70. Every budget I move forward for, $7,500, but if there's money returned, it's just reutilizing that fund. So almost every year the program is growing in its ability? I'm sorry, no, it, it's um, recycled, so it's recycled funds. So. Jamie, do you? I think more often than not, I think we ended up, so this is a, 
uh, countywide program. All the all the jurisdictions are putting money in, and my understanding is at this point that we actually put our initial money in, and they haven't asked us. We haven't had to put new money in. Um, in a, I don't remember about last year, but the first couple of years, I know that it just it's self perpetuated. So, so we won't be putting another seven thousand five hundred dollars in per year because we may already be, put that. Yeah, in I think there may be some years cycling we, through. Yeah, there may be some years when we need to, but. In general, I don't think it's an every year expense. Thank you. On the 38th Avenue project, was that the mid peninsula housing one that we had about uh, 10 months ago? Yes, we gave them initial funding towards uh, pre development costs. Thank you. Did I hear you correctly say that Merlon Geyer is not planning to do any redevelopment in the next eight years? Oh, no. So I think, uh, sorry. That's what I thought I heard. I just wanted to click. Sorry. With the um, initial letters, they were so loud. I'm sorry. The initial letters, that was the stance they were taking is the numbers that we put on their properties was making it infeasible and they would not be developing those in the next eight years. Now that we've made it more practical, I think it, it's more of a poss possibility. Okay. They have not given me a timeline for when. All right. Well, let's hope it's in the next eight years. Um, and then I, I remember, I'm, I apologize, um, I recall us as a council talking about a land use study to incentivize development on the mall property, but I can't recall what the timeline was like for that or if we had put money towards it or what the, I can't, I just can't remember. Can you remind me? Sure. Um, so we have $25,000 towards a study for the uh, mall for land use incentives for redevelopment. We have begun working on that study, but due to the recent events with our housing element, we're putting that on pause because we're actually implementing a, probably the number one strategy that would have come out of that study. Um, so Cosmont is on hold for now. Once we've moved forward, once we have a certified housing element, we really don't want that to get in the way of the housing element update. Then we'll bring for we'll bring forward either an update on what we think we should be doing with that or the, we've got to, um, our plan is to move forward with the menu of options for land use that it can help with the rest of the corridor actually that's the plan thank you I just have a follow-up on that so has the twenty five thousand dollars been spent Yet, or is it possible that we may not spend that if we decide that we don't need it at a future date? A decent portion of that; those funds have been spent. They've they been have. preparing. Um, they've been working on it already. They've been working yeah, on okay. it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I had a like a con in conjunction to your question about um, Merlone Geyer. Are they or have they been in the past um, talking to the other owners, like say of you know the Olive Garden? spot or other things that could possibly maybe tie into so numbers. during the 2019 development they definitely were talking to the adjacent property owners yeah and there's a they they all have to vote and agree on things in order for projects to move forward at the capitola mall okay so there is definitely um a level of communication that happens with any development that goes through the mall properties okay all right thank you All right, seeing no additional questions, we will bring this to public comment. If there is any public comment on this item about the housing element update and 2023 annual report. Seeing none, we'll bring it back to council. Uh, this is also just receiving an update. Does staff need any guidance from councilors? Just informational. It was informational, but if you have any concerns about the path we're taking, it'd be great to hear that now. Any concerns? No concerns. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to item 9C, which is the special events and park regulations. And I will welcome Nikki. Um, how's the mic? 
Um, it's on. Oh. Okay. <laughs> just speak. Right. Just speak directly into the mic. We'll we'll, we'll try the uh, adjustment. Okay. So, good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Um, so, as you may remember, this item was on an, a very long agenda, um, and it was intended to be presented by Captain Sarah Ryan and myself. Um, due to scheduling conflicts, she was unable to be at this meeting, so I am presenting for both of us. However, um, here with us is Esme, who is the individual in the police department that processes all of our um, special event applications. And so when come time for questions, she will be available to answer in a significantly more detail than I would actually be able to. So. Um, but you kind of know where we're going with that. So um, the intent here is to introduce the special event application process as well as um, a park regulation permitting process um, and to create a comprehensive permitting system for public assemblies, events, and use of city property to be consistent with First Amendment right to gather. Um, so, as you're aware, our city produces um, two levels of special events. We do we have a major special event permit process, which serves over 200 attendees um, and has impacts to city services. We also have a minor special event permit, and that's intended for any uh, for less than 200 attendees, and would uh, be requesting minimal impact to city services. I'll go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is just a quick reminder about what kind of events in the city are major special events right now. And the next slide, please. And then these are the events in the city that are currently as a minor special event. Go ahead. All right, so the, um, the ordinance here before you is really taking um, kind of the, the process for our special event permit and making it um, a clean and consistent process. So currently, uh, the, there are minor special events have no threshold for, special, for specification. Um, the proposed changes to minor events would be more specific about 75 to 200 people um, and not requiring road closures. Currently, our general events do not have any thresholds. Our major events with the proposed changes would are, are specified as being more than 200 people and requiring closures of major roads. Um, the proposed changes updates the language to protect the expressive act, or protect expressive activity um, by the First Amendment. These changes. Um, Currently, there is no set fee schedule for special events, and so the proposed changes would be that, not at this meeting, but another one, um, council would set special event application fees and cost recovery fees for services needed. And then um, currently, all of the kind of things that fall outside of um, any special event permit process is solved through an encroachment permit. Um, so the proposed changes actually allow us to eliminate um, and determine what is not based on the updated process. So go to the next slide, please. Now, as you had noticed that there are numbers, um, they start at 75 for a minor and then go up from there. Um, we, in parks, often have individuals that are approaching us that are smaller groups and they're looking for a process. Currently, um, in parks, uh, it is a first come first serve basis. So if you wanted to have your reunion gathering in one of the parks, um, you would just first come first serve show up. So in the top five things that cause conflict um, in recreation, this is one of these issues, which is why we're, we're talking about it. Right now, recreation currently manages 
field and court rentals through a rental slash permit process, but it's very specifically for renting fields or renting um, our courts for athletic uses. The public often inquires about a process for these small gatherings. They come in and they ask us about how they can do their bounce houses, what kind of barbecues that they can have in the parks because they're planning their birthday parties. Um, and currently we don't really have any answers for them because of that first come first serve situation. Having a park permit uh, would provide an actual procedure uh, and it would put us in alignment with all of the other um, parks and recreation agencies in our county. Uh, currently, we are the only ones that do not have um, a process such as this. Um, it would be used for small groups, up to 74 people, because at that 75, we would be switching to a minor special event. Um, and then obviously, this would not be for an expressed activity, expressive activity, sorry. Um, and if um, this is approved by council, the uh, recreation staff would be developing an application packet. An application packet um, would detail the required information for um, renting spaces that are available um, and kind of the information necessary. Um, some of the things that we would detail, if you'll go to the next slide, please, is the specific locations in the parks that um, are available for permit. So, uh, regarding Esplanade Park, uh, an individual, if they were wanting to coordinate, say, their reunion or something, um, they wouldn't have access to the whole, they would have the bandstand, they wouldn't have the dance floor, it would be specific to the red-lined grass area. Um, the ordinance that was drafted that is in the packet details that in Esplanade Park, uh, bounce houses and barbecues would not be allowed. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so here we're looking at Jade Street Park. Um, we have had situations in the past where people have tried to do field rentals for larger gatherings in order to like have a birthday with a bounce house. Um, so we would uh, identify areas of the fields, uh, sports fields or athletic fields that could be used for those kind of events. But the advantage of having a park permit um, is that within recreation, we would also be able to effectively communicate to individuals when the fields are rented for the athletic use purposes. Um, in addition, we would be identifying the grass spaces towards um, the, uh, close to the community center. Currently, we often have um, individuals that are hosting birthday parties and they will um, sometimes set up bounce houses in that area without any communication. And so we are identifying this spot as an interest to the community for these kind of events. Next slide, please. And then also in Monterey Park, again, there is the um, athletic field potential conflict with individuals that are looking to have their small groups. Um, and so we would be able to identify that maybe the front part of Monterey Park could be identified for a small group gathering and still have the actual soccer field use available, but can coordinate those kind of schedules um, since we are already working with the field rental schedule on top of that. All right, so, um, <clears throat> excuse me. The staff is currently working on a fee study to update the fee schedule. Uh, the updated fee schedule will include recommending billing rates for city resources associated with, uh, with special events as well as um, park permit. Uh, staff expects that fee study and schedule to be presented to council um, this spring or at an earlier meeting. And then the recommend, recommendation for this evening is introduced by title only, waiving further reading of the text, an ordinance of the city of Capitola repealing and replacing Capitola Municipal Code, chapter 9.36 special events, and chapter 12.40 parks regulations to create a comprehensive permitting system for public assemblies, events, and use of city property. And with that, 
I am available for questions. Thank you. Questions? It's a good time to not ask questions, but give you comments on maybe changing some of the locations. I think, I think we'll do questions first, and then we'll come back to comments after public comment. Questions? Oh, sorry. Questions on this? Okay. Um, I was wondering if it's possible to, since we had such a good turnout for the Halloween parade, if that could be moved to a considered a major event. I don't know if we need to specify that today or what, um, but that's just a thought. Um, and then how, how would we be regulating the areas that are used? Like if they're just supposed to use the grass at Esplanade Park, how do we keep that contained? <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, people will do as they do. Um, but to uh, the, the benefit of having an actual permit process is an opportunity to very clearly communicate the expectations when they go through the, the permit process. It gives staff the opportunity to explain um, that maybe that's not the best place for your wedding. Uh, but it also gives staff, you know, to outline any um, insurance situations that might be necessary for having a bounce house involved with your event. Um, and so the permit would outline the expectations. And then if they are not following the expectations and staff would receive a complaint, then we can follow up. Okay. And then um, in regards to using, like, a sports field, you so you guys would have to be responsible of knowing the field use for recreation versus when they would be available for rental. Correct. So it wouldn't be like a going on at the same time. Type Correct. Of yeah. So because we're already managing the rental of all of our athletic fields, we're very familiar with the schedule. And if someone were to approach us to permit the space, then we would be able to check the space, check the schedule, communicate with them anything that they might occur, that might they might experience with their, you know, gathering, and then um, work with them to identify what would actually work for the whole community and good use of the public space as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Those are my questions. Um, so thank you, Nikki, for the presentation. Um, for the park use permit, are the seven locations identified in your report today the only seven locations that folks could essentially ask for a park use permit for? Or are those just examples? Are you referring to the bulleted list that's actually in the ordinance or the red lines? Your red I, lines. So those, uh, those were more of examples, mm -hmm. um, just so that council could see what we, how we would be communicating to the public that would be requesting a permit um, for this is this is the space that you would be talking about. Um, we would need to just do a little bit of a further analysis for each spot um, in order to communicate effectively in the application. So the park use permit is for any location, any park at any time that someone can. I guess because what I'm look what I'm envisioning for the other cities is that there are designated areas, you know, I would go online, rent, Monterey Park, space one. I don't see any spaces identified in this park use permit. I, I see the red lines, but there's nothing specifically identified, so I'm just looking for clarity. Yeah, so it's a little bit of A, a little bit of B there. So um, it in the ordinance that is in the packet, there's a bulleted list of parks that are very specifically outlined that are available to permit. And then through the application process, as you explain, we would be identifying grassy space number one in Jade Street Park, grassy space number two in Jade Street Park. In, uh, in our other local um, parks and recreation areas, it's, just, it's like picnic areas is often what it's referred to. Um, we don't have any picnic areas, so we would have to, we have to talk about kind of those spots. And so the map um, with the red lines drawn is kind of like how we would start to communicate. And there are more details to come as you identify. We would be, um, through that application process, giving an option of like, 
checking grassy space number one at Jade Street Park is what I'm interested in permitting. Is there a reason that council hasn't received the identified? It's hard for me to appro like approve a general park um, use permit just because the locations haven't been identified um, on what's rentable to the community. Um, is there a reason that you haven't identified them first or you're going to bring them back after we would approve this park use permit? Um, well, I'm, I'm happy to take feedback now on it. My, without the ordinance in place, um, the need to develop the complete application process isn't here yet. So we, I could come back and present on it if that is something that council would like. I'm happy to take feedback as well. Um, but as the, the item was just for the ordinance first and to, and to make the um, updates to that, and then we would be creating an application similar to what other agencies use in our area. Okay, I'll, I'll save my comments for after. Thank you, those are all my questions. Councilmember Peters, you were talking about I just have a quick question. Um, so this is for our parks, and I'm wondering about beach use, if people try to get specific use of the Capitola Beach or Hooper's Beach for weddings, or I see now there's companies that like set up sunset dates and all that. Um, are we allowed to even permit a specific use of specific parts of the beach, or is that Coastal Commission prevents us from doing that? So it's it was very specifically not put in the parks ordinance, um, but the rest of the answer I'd have to look. I'm guessing we're not allowed to, but I was just curious. It's challenging for us. We do have a specific SCP special that permits that do take place on the beach. Think some of the surf competition, women on waves, some of those. But reserving the sand for a non-ocean specific event, we run into trouble with the Coastal Commission. So that makes sense. that's one of the reasons why we kept kept the separate makes sense okay thank you can i rewind back to the last question so the language about the this is the code language here um, about the specific areas within the following parks would be available for exclusive use permits so it identifies um, as nikki said the five sites parks that would be eligible for it right now it says the code says that the application would identify the specific use areas um, if the council wants, we could modify that to say that would be established by policy or set by the council by resolution. Um, I don't know that we would want that in the code itself, like the specific areas of each park, but we could have sort of an elevated level of review uh, in between code and in between staff and putting it in the application. So just tossing that idea. Further questions? Okay, uh, with that, we'll bring this item to public comment. Any members of the public that would like to comment on our special events and park regulations? Welcome back. Thank you. My name is James Ewing. That was actually a really thorough presentation. And the questions of both you, and Mrs. Brown, and the city manager's input was really useful. I, one of those areas is an area I was in just today, and we'll probably be in there on Sunday, so that'll just be entertaining. Since I have done a fair amount of events at the beach, not in this city, but it certainly wouldn't be against it, I suppose I'll just inquire further of the specifics, you know, because if I'm going to break the law, of course I don't want to hurt anybody, but I want to um, be impressive if I do that. So thank you for this. That was a great presentation. Thank you. All right. Uh, we will bring it back to council for comments and discussion and uh, potentially a vote. We'll start at this end. Any comments? No? Comments? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll now explain what I was getting at to, to the rest of my council here. Um, as, as someone who goes to many birthday parties <laughs> um, and lives this on a weekly basis. Um, I guess my only concern is with other parks, there's identified spaces. And right now, the way it's, it's suggesting is that any kind of group would need to, to have a park use permit 
for any sort of party. I know there's some clarifying language, but that's just how it reads to me. I'd much rather see identified spaces um, before approving the park use permit so that it's just really clear to the community this is what we're, we're they're signing up for and that we're not saying that to have a birthday party with 25 of your friends you need to have this park use permit um, I want I want there's an accessibility aspect for me that I think everyone should have access to our parks to freely play and not have to worry about bringing groups of their their classrooms or classes to go on a walk walk I'm thinking about Jade Street it's going to be really popular and there's going to be use there and I know that there needs to be balance between use um, for big parties or parties up to 75 but sometimes you know a group of 30 might feel the need to, to access and so I'm using thinking of examples at Blue Bar Ball Park where there is um, Anna Jean Cummings Park I should say um, where there's gazebos and you can rent them and you know that's the space for them I don't see that here so I just have some concerns about um, making an overarching uh, permit process that just lays out all of our parks. Um, so I much rather see it come back to us with really clear designated spots that council um, can review and we can then approve the park use permit. I think it's fine. And also I heard you say at a later time, the fee schedule would come back to us because I also don't want to create something. The last thing I want to do is build our beautiful Jade Street Park and then someone has to rent it at a lot of money to have access to it. So I know that it's going to come back to us, the fee schedule, to decide on how much the rates will be later, but I just wanted to throw that out there. So my my recommendation is that we could approve this, but pulling out the park use permit with Nikki coming back with um, designated areas of use um, where these permits would apply to. Uh, can I get clear, uh, clarification following up on that? Are these permits required for anyone who wants to have a party in the park, or is it just for those who want to ensure that they get exclusive access? Um, I would say that it's the latter. Okay. And particularly um, so that we reduce the conflict that currently happens when lots of people are expecting to use what is a very limited space of resource in the city. Um, as well as an opportunity for the city to set appropriate expectations and ensure that um, necessary insurance is obtained for potentially risky activity, i.e. bounce houses. Um, and uh, as well as what this ordinance does also is gets very clear about the expectations around barbecues, which is also a current conflict um, for weekend goers and group activities in the park. So it, it sounds like it would be required if you wanted a bounce house or a barbecue or just a birthday party that doesn't include those, but you want to make sure you reserve this space for your party personally. If you were someone who doesn't plan a bounce house, doesn't plan a barbecue, you're just going to have cake and pizza at a park, you can still do that at any time. You don't have to get a permit for it. You're just not guaranteed that you won't show up and someone else will have already reserved it. Yes, you are correct. Okay. And I, I guess I would just add Mayor Brown that and that's all that's fine i just think it's important for us to identify those spaces where that be where that's going to take place um and also you you brought up a really important point um about the the bounce house and the barbecues and all of those things actually cost additional but like you need an extra permit for music and you need so the costs endured for like a party of up to 74 there are additional fees that could potentially um, add up for for something like for a party like this or a event or a wedding. Um, so, <laughs> um, so I think it's just really important to lay out where this is going to pertain to, so that people know that they can just go have pizza and, and 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 not get kicked out at a later time because there's some random event, not random permitted event, happening. Um. Clarifying information, or should we come back and go comments or now? I have an idea. Have an idea. Oh, okay. Yes, <laughs> might address Council Member Brooks' concern. So, should can we just take a full uh, three-minute three, minute, three, minute, three, three minute, minute break? Sure. Okay. Yeah. We are going to take a three-minute break. I'm sorry. We'll come back. I promise. We'll take a three-minute break, uh, and then we will return uh, to Council deliberation.
and trying to imagine a scenario of people crossing the street with their potential birthday party equipment. And um, so that was ultimately why it didn't make the list, but it could definitely be added. Yeah, the, the, the city lot's just across the street, and, and there is some parking on the roadway. But it, yeah, I just think about another spot. And then I was uh, uh, thinking about Esplanade Park. That area is so highly used all the time. And just for birthday parties or small gatherings, it, it seems like it should be held at a higher threshold for just special events, such as women on waves. That's just a thought that I had, because it is used so much on the weekends. We also went back and forth with Espl Esplanade Park quite a bit. Um, and, and it really just kind of came down to um, that there's already so many things that are already happening there and that this would provide us a process to set the expectations and to communicate with anybody um, that would be interested in setting up their wedding down there or something like that, um, as well as a big part of that conversation is how we came up with no bounce houses, no barbecues, um, because it, those that equipment did not seem appropriate in that space. And the last thing, I would be concerned about equity and making sure that people who don't have the same means as others can still use our park. Yeah. Um, did my mic go out? Oh, okay. The, um, one of the, there are fee waivers that I know the other, uh, in order for, like, scholarships is really what I mean to say, not a waiver, but there are scholarship programs and other agencies in order to apply for um, birthday party uses and stuff like that. So we could definitely look at those similar types of programs as well. Thanks. I just wanted to um, echo some of the things that um, Councilmember Brooks and Councilmember Clark said um, to make it make sure that we know where these are gonna be and that we don't end up unintentionally restricting public access, although I know the goal is to do the opposite of that. Um, and of course, the equity issue of expenses, it wouldn't, we don't want only rich people using the parks because the poor people can't afford it or anything like that. And then uh, finally, I would say that I do also agree that Noble Gulch Park would be a great location with the parking lot right across there is a crosswalk I don't know that that's a particularly dangerous crosswalk but I do know that that park is very underutilized so thank you um, yes I'm interested in looking at Noble Gulch um, we may just have to enhance our crosswalks like we're doing elsewhere um, I think that while I want to remain equitable I do think if there is going to be use that is outside of a normal park use like a bounce house or barbecues where there is some type of liability there's got to be some type of permitting something signed and it doesn't have to break the bank I don't think um, but just to like really kind of keep us on the safer side of things and and if somebody does want exclusive use of zone one of Jade Street Park then they and they have the right to do that too and bring I don't know any kind of weird games that they want to play would be fun um but yeah thank you for doing this it's great uh, I didn't see on the list is Hidden Park included in this no it is not included in that and, and again um when we were evaluating the list of parks we um the impact of the residents uh, that would surround that park was a consideration and not adding it to this list. Yeah, because it's hidden. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hidden in the list. Um, oh, I had a question, actually. Um, I know this isn't exactly what we're talking about, but I was curious, do we do reservations on some of the facilities like the tennis court, basketball court, skate park, things like that? So, yeah, so we currently do do um, for our athletic courts and fields. We have had a rental process um, for the use of those spaces um, since I got here. 
including, I mean, the field at Jade Street is an athletic field, right? Yeah. So that so. could have so like two different processes to reserve that then? Well, so so right now, and, and hopefully we would, all of this would come into an alignment um, <laughs> through an application process. Um, so, right, but right now, yeah, we, and, and honestly, like our fields are booked out through the spring. So all of our soccer fields, all of our softball fields um, are, are booked out through various sports groups. So correct me if I'm wrong. I don't believe we have a process to reserve anything in McGregor Park. No, we do not. So we do for the tennis courts and the fields. Oh, and there's not a reason. Hmm. So one idea to potentially move forward this evening, I've heard this is the list. This is I mean, this seems to be where we're focusing is the park use permits. And this is the list of the locations, and I've heard at least one council member, maybe two, suggesting whether or not Esplanade Park should be on the list at all. One option here would be to add something at the end, an item F, and this is getting up to Council Member Brooks's point that says the specific areas in the parks that are available for rentals shall be established by policy set by the city council. So that might address some of the concerns is that we add basically a new item F specifically calls out that we have a policy that says these are the spaces that are available. And that would come back to us? To set that policy? Yeah, okay. you would set that policy. And the fees would will come back to us yeah. as well? Yeah. Okay. My suggestion would actually be that you write it a little broader so that you, so that a policy would capture what Council Member Brooks raised, which is a list of specific areas within these parks. And then if there's anything in the future that you want to add to the policy, you could add it, it would come back to the council who could adopt it by resolution rather than having to amend your ordinance. It just gives you a little bit of flexibility going forward and you already see that this is a good opportunity for that flexibility. So you could adopt the ordinance tonight. We drop in a line, I could read some language into the record, um, make any other modifications that you would like and then yes, Shortly in the future, we would bring back a policy for your consideration. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, so we would add the the motion to be to add um, F to this current, what is this called? Resolution? What is this? It's the ordinance, ordinance to this ordinance. Um, I do just want to touch back before we move on with the formal motion about Noble Gulch and Esplanade. Noble Gulch, Gulch? I'm tired. Noble Gulch. Um, I think what is a great idea, but then now that I think a little bit more deeply about it, there are no bathrooms. And so when you're having up to 75 people with, bounce, with three-year-olds bouncing in bounce houses, it's probably not the best. Um, so I don't, I originally thought that would be good, but I'm worried about bathroom use. And then council member Clark, Esplanade Park, were you saying yay or nay? I was saying uh, keep it at the threshold for special events. Like bigger things. Bigger events, just, just not uh, your birthday parties and other things. But I almost think we should include all our parks so that as we move forward, who knows, maybe the skate park might turn into a place where they do want to have birthday parties and stuff. If we can put some type of language in there that it can include all our parks and we can, as we want to change the policy or the locations, we can add that as we go. That makes sense. Um, I would just want to standardize like what um, essentially is a reservable spot. So when we see the policy come back with more detail that the, this is what a park use permit site entails and it's like uniform so then i don't wake up one morning like ah i want a little patch of grass to be a on and do an amendment you know i think there's some criteria that we need to set some standards around that um policy as it comes forward is that is that where we would write it sam or, or even to take it a little bit further why don't we include all facilities the wharf somebody wanted to have something on the wharf specific policies 
I mean, a park is a park. I think there's definition around that um, and for what it's supposed to be. So I'm going to wait. I think the wharf might bring us back into the concern about the beach too. Yeah. Is that you know people? Yeah, people can go get married on the wharf, but to have exclusive access to it, I don't know if we're allowed to do that. I think they're writing our policy. Our All right. maybe they'll type it so I can read it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have a couple modifications. So I think to capture the council's comments, I think that we would modify. Section 12.40.040A, the last line would now read, specific areas within all city parks that are available for exclusive use shall be identified in the parks policy. And then we would strike the list in the ordinance. We would identify specific uses specific areas in the policy. And then in addition, we would add a section F to 12.40.040 and section F would read, all park use permits must also comply with the parks policy adopted by council by resolution as amended from time to time. Does that work? That, that'll come back in the policy this we'll is just, in the policy we'll bring it back you'll adopt it by resa so to clarify this is just an ordinance um creating the this. fact that we are even going to do this and then right. the specific policy about which parks and which spaces and how much it would cost will come back to us later and that's what this ordinance will refer to as the policy that we have yet to create that's right and I just want to know that staff heard my feedback about being really specific in what is identified as use of, use of space or a rentable space just so that we have standards really defined in that policy because, again, is it 2 feet by 2 feet or 12 feet by 12 feet? I think standardizing a process would make, yeah. make no sense. Um, I am okay with moving forward with um, staff's, uh, our city manager, our city attorney's Comments and the proposed motion on the table. Okay, so I think the motion would be do you, Mayor, do you want to do the ordinances separately or as one? I don't know how we have that listed in the agenda. Um, it's one, it's just one. Okay, an ordinance, yeah. Okay, so I think the motion would be to, uh, yeah, I think it would be to introduce by title only waiving for the reading of the text an ordinance of the city capital or repealing and replacing capital and mini code chapter 9.36 special events as written and chapter 12.40 park regulations with the changes read into the record by the city attorney to create a comprehensive permitting system for public assemblies, events, and use of city property. I'd like to make that motion. Uh, and I'll second it. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All right, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Good work, team. We'll move on to our final item of the night, which is item 9D uh, pertaining to remote public participation. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Um, as a brief recap for you this evening, on October 26th, the City of Capitola uh, endured a Zoom bombing event during a regular City Council meeting. Following that meeting, the City suspended the use of Zoom for remote public comments. The City still accepts public comments in person and written format. Um, members of the public can drop off handwritten comments to the city prior to the meeting, and those comments are all included in the record of the meeting agenda. During our January 11th City Council meeting, staff brought forward a report to the City Council, which included a survey of California cities that have been affected by Zoom bombing. Um, at that time, approximately half or more of the cities had suspended use of Zoom, and the City Council directed staff to bring back this item in March for further city council discussion with an updated survey. 
The agenda packet included an updated survey for the city council of the 60, I believe it was 66 cities surveyed, approximately 64% of them have um, suspended the use of Zoom. I'm sorry to say that Zoom bombings continue to occur in California. As um, recently as February 13th, approximately four cities were affected by Zoom bombings on February 13th alone. Two of those cities had brought back Zoom for their first meetings, and at the first meeting following the return of Zoom, they endured a second Zoom bombing event. Other cities, such as Berkeley and San Diego, have endured multiple ongoing um, Zoom bombing events. Their city clerks report that it's now become a routine part of their meeting practices. Um, and anecdotally, city clerks report lessened public participation at meetings, lessened attendance by regular members of their community. So it is continuing to be an ongoing issue in California agencies. So I'm available for any questions. I can provide more information. I can share the survey up on the screen if you'd like. Um, but otherwise, we are here to await your direction. Thank you. Questions? Questions? Yeah, so um, you stated that there was four Zoom bombings in 2024. Is that correct? Yes. I only see two on the uh, sheet. Is that also correct? So some of these cities are experiencing regular ongoing Zoom bombing, so it's hard to track in the sheet like the exact yeah. date because otherwise I would have to list out multiple. Um, however, the four that occurred on February 13th, I don't know if those were listed because at that point we were still collecting data. It was Rancho Cordova, Laguna Beach, San Carlos, and I believe the city of Sunnyvale. Um, the city of Vallejo and I believe Sebastopol have also had recent Zoom bombing events. And Sebastopol is a really small agency. It's even smaller than Capitola. So the size of the agency really doesn't matter um, with this type of event. So are you saying that there's a total of six unique cities that have had Zoom bombings in 2024? At least. Yes, at least at six. At least. Okay. That would have been good data to have here on this list. And... Um, of those that um, happened in 2020. Oh, okay, so my other question was the date of the incident, That is that as of the time of the study, the date of the latest incident, is that right? So again, some of these are like ongoing, so I wasn't able to list like all of the dates of incident. So I think I listed some of the first date of incident, like for example, Berkeley and San Diego, um, but I tried to list in the current Zoom status, the ongoing um, repeated Zoom bombing events. Okay, so it sounds like it's the latest events in general. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, okay. All right, uh, with that, we will bring this item to public comment. Uh, we will now open public comment for anyone who has comments on our remote public participation. Welcome back. Thank you. My name is still James Ewing. I wonder how this really affects the First Amendment and free speech. I know that four years ago in the Santa Cruz City Council, Drew Glover brought up this question with uh, Tony Condotti. Basically said, we don't really support it, but we can't really stop it. Now, I was here physically on October 26th, and that was wild. I think I have listened to that once online. Um, what concerns me is the last time this was brought up about you know, at least six weeks ago, there was a piece of paper, and it seemed like most of the different jurisdictions in the area had stopped Zoom meetings. Now, I can recall meetings. Like, I didn't make public comments on January 12th, actually, the morning of January 13th until after 2.30 in the morning. And I had to leave that meeting to take care of some business because I needed to be on the road by six o'clock in the morning and I used my phone and I must have been disconnected from the meeting at least 30 times. I was blown away. I got brand new 2023 weapons technology. It's a great phone by Motorola. So it'd be great if this room was always full. You guys might be here longer, but at least some people are here. But to restrict, I've had all kinds of issues with trying to use the Zoom, and I kind of told myself I wouldn't. 
I'd rather set up any of three commercial sound groups of equipment I personally own to make a statement if they shut stuff down and people can't talk. But once again, I'm concerned about the First Amendment rights. And I think people need to be careful with what they say and mindful of just what I witnessed earlier this evening. So it just is what it is. That's my two cents. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment? Seeing none, we will bring it back to council. Um, I think for the sake of it being in the minutes and in the record, uh, if our city attorney, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that under First Amendment and free speech, we are required to accept public comment in the room, that we cannot restrict it based on topic, that we have the right to restrict the amount of time public comment is given, um, that Zoom public comment is not required. Um, is there, am I missing anything else? I just want to address, so that it's in the minutes, the issues of free speech and First Amendment, because I do think that's important. Yes, um, you are correct. There are a couple nuances I would add. One is, you are not required to allow public comment by Zoom or remote public comment at all. If you do choose to allow it, the same standards for free speech are applied to that as they are for public comment in the room. The reason it's an issue is, as the court pointed out, remote public comment provides more of an opportunity for people to provide off-topic or uh, offensive comments without identifying themselves. Um, and we are required to permit public comment, to allow public comment, so long as it is either within the subject matter jurisdiction of the agency, as long as it is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the agency, related to a particular agenda item, and is not disruptive. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, okay, discussion? I, I, like our speaker earlier said, I, I worry about First Amendment rights. Um, hopefully we can one day maybe get back to Zoom and have people speaking, but at this time, um, with all the issues that we're having, we should probably monitor every six months um, or quarterly and, and, and see what's happening. The other thing with IA, um, sounded like one of those calls was not even a real person. So I mean, with those issues, so there's a lot of things going on, but I think we should we should re review it often. Yeah, I would go ahead and say that, I, what, what did we do, three months since the last time? Um, I think we could push it more to six and see what the climate is. Um, and as stated by the city attorney, um, I don't necessarily see the infringement on the First Amendment rights when you have multiple options to address the council in, in other modalities. Thank you. Can I ask a clarifying question? Um, when you said six months, did you mean six months total, including the previous three months, or six months from now? From now is fine. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so I have um, some other comments, too. It seems like the vast majority of these cases happened in September and October of 2023. Um, I personally would be inclined, as I believe that public engagement is a very important aspect of what we do, and although it doesn't literally infringe upon the First Amendment right, I believe that it goes against the spirit of that amendment. So I would like to see us um, testing the water as soon as possible. Um, I see that... Um, with the updated information that was not included in the table, approximately 10% of those out of the 65-ish have had an incident in 2024, which isn't a lot. And I would expect that number to continually go down at a rapid pace as these racist or extremist groups lose their steam. I think it is just people, you know, bored and confused getting a kick out of the internet and as uncomfortable as that was and that was the most uncomfortable experience to date for me in city council i 
Um, do you still believe that it's a very important um, means of communication that we should not um, remove lightly, as there are a lot of people who have difficulties coming here in person? The weight of an email is not the same as an in-person comment. I think it's important to recognize that. So I would say at the very least, if not trying sooner, we should redo this study in three months from now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, Council Member Peterson, I would, I would almost side with you completely. However, Zoom has been a new age um, part of our community in just the last several years. This is something new we're all dealing with. My, my deep concerns is that we don't have the ability to manage when it happens. We've been communicating with the governor's office and creating new systems of approach on how to deal with these issues. Um, our technology um, being taken over during that experience. I would, I, I'm happy with the six months and checking in, but I also just want to stress that there's still nothing we can do to protect our listeners, our community, ourselves from hearing hate speech. Um, and I think that's really important to set a, a, a stance on that. And because um, I don't want to listen to it, it's not okay. Um, so I'm happy with um, coming back to this in six months, but I also want it to be able, want to see what are our options again, if it's been addressed by the League of Cities or the governor's office, if there's still conversations about, you know, how council and other jurisdictions, our school boards. There's so many elected bodies that have to deal with this. What are our options at that point? And I know our, our, our clerk here has looked at some of those, but um, seeing that in six months would be really great. All right, uh, I'll say I, I agree. I think a six month from now review period is appropriate. Um, Personally, I think Zoom was a, an incredibly beneficial tool during the pandemic when there was no other opportunity for, for anyone to come in person. Um, people can still send emails. They can still provide written comment. Um, they can send others to speak on their behalf. I think that we are essentially doing no different than we did before the pandemic when we were incredibly limited in our options. But as I said before, people become quite emboldened to say things when they have the safety of hiding behind a keyboard that they would not otherwise say when they are required to stand up and say it in person and look people in the face when they say it. And so I do appreciate um, that while we may not agree with everything that is said in public comment, that those who are here in person to say it have the right to do so. And if anyone wanted to um, speak the kind of hate speech or interrupt a meeting in person, then they would have to make it known that they were doing so, so that we could tell them that they were interrupting a meeting and they would be escorted out by law enforcement should they be interrupting a public meeting. Um, that being said, there's not that risk when you're behind a keyboard. And so I, I do want, I feel the need to protect our citizens um, from that kind of behavior. Um, I appreciate that you took the time to look into this for us again and appreciate that we're asking you to do it once more six months from now. Um, there will come a time where we can't keep pushing this every six months. And we will have to make a final decision on whether or not we want to move forward as we did pre-pandemic or bring back Zoom. But eventually this can't be an every six month decision. Um, and six months from now uh, is what, September? So that will be almost a year from the original Zoom bombing, and at that point, we will have discussed this three times. So just, um, you know, all of us who, um, you know, keep that in mind, I think, uh, you know, the final, final thing I want to add in this is that our meetings are broadcast on YouTube and um, on our city website, and we don't control who watches. And it could be families, and it could be children, and we need to be mindful of the fact um, that the things that might be shared on Zoom and Zoom bombing in instances um, are, are harmful not only for adults, but for families and others who might be watching. So keeping that in mind. May I just add um, something I can offer Council Member Peterson is within uh, at the three month mark, if the city council would like, we could offer like a small update through the city manager's Friday update. Um, and I can specifically highlight any new occurrences that have happened. 
uh, to address your feedback earlier. So that could be kind of a halfway checkpoint. And if at that time there's a significant decrease in these events, the city council could direct staff to bring this back earlier than six months. Yeah, I, I would very much appreciate that. Um, and is now an appropriate time to add a couple comments? Yeah, of course. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I would just say just a couple things um, that I want to reiterate and state um, regarding the fact that Zoom wasn't common place three years ago. The fact is that now it is a part of the vast majority of Americans' lives. It is an important technology for communication. And I think just because a technology didn't exist in the past doesn't mean that it's not, you know, shouldn't be taken as a, almost a staple of daily life today, which it is. Um, and then my second comment would be to re reiterate the fact that not everybody is able-bodied. People have obligations taking care of their children. They have, maybe they don't own a car. Maybe it provides a significant um, difficulty for them to get here. And the written comment, again, is not nearly as impactful, I believe, as a verbal comment with video or without video. Thank you. Really noted. Thank you. Do we have a motion on this item? Move to make a motion that we um, take this back in six months from now. I'll second that. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. Okay. Any abstentions? Hearing none. Uh, motion carries uh, with uh, Council Members Clark, Council Member Morgan, Vice Mayor Brooks, and Mayor Brown voting aye. Council Member Peterson. Uh, opposing and no abstentions. With that, we are at the end of our meeting. We will adjourn to our next regularly scheduled meeting on March 28th at 6 p.m. Until then, please take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Have a good night.